Chapter One of On Respiration in Parva Naturalia by Aristotle. Translated by William Alexander Hammond. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Geoffrey Edwards. Chapter One A few of the earlier physicists have treated the subject of respiration but in regard to the purpose which it subserves in the animal organism some of them have given no explanation whatever and others although they have discussed it have been wrong in their statements and have lacked empirical knowledge of the facts furthermore they declare that all animals respire this however is untrue it will be necessary therefore to return to these points in order that we be not thought to make unfounded charges against writers who are no longer living it is plain that all animals with lungs breathe but amongst these the animals that have a spongy anemic lung need respiration less than the others consequently they can remain owing to their physical strength a considerable time under water all oviparous animals have a spongy lung as is the case in frogs again water tortoises and land tortoises can remain a long time under water in these animals the lung has little heat because it has little blood consequently when it has been once inflated it affects refrigeration by its motion and enables the animal to continue a long time under water without breathing even in these cases however when the animal is forced to hold its breath too long it is suffocated for none of these animals can inhale water as fishes do all animals on the other hand whose lung is full of blood have greater need of respiration because of their greater heat as to the animals that have no lung at all they have no respiration at all chapter two democritus of abdera and certain other writers on the subject of respiration have not spoken definitely about the animals last named but they appear to assert that all animals breathe anaxagoras however and diogenes make the statement that all animals respire and they say that fishes and oysters are endowed with a sort of respiration anaxagoras declares that when fishes discharge water through their gills they inhale the air that is developed in the mouth for a vacuum does not exist and so respire diogenes on the other hand says that when fishes discharge water through their gills they inhale air by the action of the vacuum formed in the mouth out of the water which surrounds the mouth on the theory that water contains air these views however are untenable for in the first place they leave out of account half of the truth because their entire statement refers only to one aspect of the case for by respiration one understands partly inspiration and partly expiration and they have nothing to say in explanation of how the latter takes place in lungless animals and it is impossible for them to give any explanation for when inspiration takes place expiration must also follow by the same channel as that employed in inspiration and these two things must succeed each other in constant alternation the consequence is that exhalation must take place at the same moment that water is being received into the mouth and in that case the one must impede the other by meeting secondly if they exhale by the mouth or gills at the moment when they discharge water the consequence will be that inspiration and expiration will be simultaneous and according to the above assertion this is the moment in which animals inspire but simultaneous inspiration and expiration is an impossibility consequently if it is true that respiration involves both inspiration and expiration and if it is further true that aquatic animals are not capable of expiration it is clear that they are also incapable of respiration chapter three again the assertion that they inhale air from the mouth or from the water through the mouth is impossible for aquatic animals have no windpipe because they have no lung but the stomach is immediately adjacent to the mouth 
and consequently the stomach would necessarily be the organ of inspiration but if this were true here the stomach would have this power in other animals also as a matter of fact it does not have this power further if aquatic animals were removed from the water they would then clearly show this capacity to respire but they do not show it furthermore we observe in those animals that respire and inhale air a certain movement in the organ of inhalation this is not observable in fishes they appear to move no organ about the stomach other than the gills whether they are in the water or are thrown gasping on the dry shore again when any respiring animal dies from suffocation in the water its breath as it forcibly leaves the body is formed into bubbles as one sees in the case of tortoises or frogs or other animals of this sort when they are forcibly drowned with fishes however this is not the case whatever method one may use because they contain no inhaled air according to the explanation of respiration above mentioned it would be possible also for men to respire when in water for if fish inhale air from water by means of their mouth why should not men and other animals do the same thing they should inhale air from the mouth quite as much as fishes if the latter have this power the former should have it also but as this is not true in the one case it evidently does not hold good in the other furthermore if fishes respire why is it that we see them die in the air and gasp as if suffocated it is not owing to lack of food the explanation given by diogenes is foolish he says that fishes when in the air inhale too much air and this is why they die whereas in the water they inhale a moderate amount but this should then be possible for land animals also in point of fact no land animal is suffocated by excessive inhalation further if all animals respire insects must evidently respire also many of them however seem to live when they are divided not only when divided into two parts but into several as in the case of the centipedes how or by what organ is it possible for these parts to breathe the chief cause of the error of these writers was their ignorance of the internal organs and also the fact that they did not grasp the truth of design in nature for by asking to what end animals are endowed with respiration and by making a test of their theory on the organs themselves as e g on the gills and lungs they would soon have discovered the real explanation chapter four democritus makes the statement it is true that respiration produces certain effects in the respiring animal viz it prevents the soul from being expelled from the body he by no means says however that nature in creating this function did so with this end in view for he is on the whole like the other physicists and makes no application of any such causality he maintains that the soul and heat have one and the same nature viz they are elemental spherical atoms consequently when these are compressed by the force of the surrounding air inhalation comes to their assistance for in the air there is a large number of the atoms which he calls mind and soul in the act of inhalation then and along with the entrance of the air these atoms also enter and by counteracting the pressure prevent the expulsion of the soul that resides in the animal body it is for this reason that life and death depend upon inspiration and expiration for when the surrounding medium by its pressure gains control and the outer air is no longer able to enter and counteract this control respiration in the animal becomes impossible and death ensues for by death one means the departure of these physical atoms from the body due to expulsion by the surrounding medium the reason however why death necessarily comes at all to every animal and why it does not come at any chance period but in the course of nature only in old age a violent death is contrary to nature he has not in the least explained and yet because this phenomenon occurs evidently at one period and not at another it behoved him to explain whether it is due to an external or to an internal cause 
further he has not a word to say regarding the origin of respiration whether its cause is external or internal and yet it is evidently not the external mind that comes to the rescue here but the principle of respiration and of respiratory movement is due to an internal cause and we are not to suppose that the force of the surrounding medium is any explanation it is also absurd to think that the surrounding medium has at once the effect of extinguishing by compression and on its entrance the opposite effect the foregoing in content and manner of statement conforms closely to the theory of democritus if one is to regard as true what was said a while ago viz that not all animals respire then we must regard the democritian explanation of death as not universally applicable but only to those cases where animals breathe but even to these cases it does not well apply as is evident from facts observed by all of us for in warm weather when we are more than usually heated we have greater need of respiration and we all breathe more rapidly when however our environment is cool and contracts and chills the body we hold our breath this is the very moment however that the air from without should enter and prevent the soul's expulsion in point of fact it is the opposite that takes place for when excessive heat is accumulated owing to its not being exhaled that is the moment we need respiration and inhalation is necessary to this the truth is men breathe rapidly when they are hot because respiration has a cooling effect at the very moment when according to the theory of democritus they would be to use a proverb quote, adding fire to fire close quote. end of chapter four Recording in memory of Mitchell Edwards. Chapter 5 of On Respiration in Parva Naturalia by Aristotle. Translated by William Alexander Hammond. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Geoffrey Edwards. Chapter the theory of circular push described in the timaeus gives no explanation whatever of the way in which heat is maintained in animals other than man whether the preservation of heat in the various animals is due to the same or different causes for if the phenomenon of respiration is found in land animals alone we must explain why they alone breathe if however it occurs in other animals also but by a different process assuming that they can all respire we must find an explanation for the difference in process furthermore the whole manner of explaining the phenomenon is fanciful for plato says that by the issuance of hot air from the mouth the surrounding air is pushed forward and is transmitted through the pores of the flesh and rests at the point from which the internal hot air issued these elements thus affect a complementary displacement owing to the fact that a vacuum is impossible in the same way the inhaled air in turn when heated is discharged and the warm air within issuing out through the mouth continues this quote, circular push close quote. and so this process which is inspiration and expiration goes constantly on the logical consequence of the theory is that expiration precedes inspiration whereas the opposite is the fact as the following proves the two things are correlated phenomena now man's last act is expiration consequently inspiration must form the beginning further the end which these processes i mean inspiration and expiration subserve in the animal body is not taken into account at all by the philosophers who advocate this theory they treat them merely as unessential phenomena we see however that they are the master factors in life and death for when a breathing animal is unable to respire at that moment death ensues further it is absurd to suppose that the issue of hot air through the mouth and the entrance of air again by the mouth should be observable by us whereas the entrance of the breath into the thorax 
and its discharge should not be observable it is also strange that respiration should mean the introduction of heat observation shows the contrary for expired air is hot whereas inspired air is cool and when the atmosphere is warm animals pant in respiring and they draw their breath frequently because the entering air does not adequately cool them chapter six we must also reject the theory that the purpose of respiration is nutrition which presupposes the feeding of internal heat by means of the breath according to this view inspiration is similar to throwing fuel on a fire and expiration follows when the fire is fed we again urge the same objections to this theory as we did to the theories enumerated above the same process or something analogous to it should be found in all animals for they all have vital heat in the next place the advocates of this theory should explain how heat is generated out of the breath the whole view is fanciful according to our observation generation of heat is due much rather to food a further consequence of their theory is that food is received and excrement discharged at the same orifice which is not seen in any other instance chapter seven empedocles also has a theory of respiration although he does not explain the purpose of respiration nor does he say definitely whether all animals are endowed with respiration or not in treating of respiration through the nostrils he fancies he is dealing with the main factor in this process he is here mistaken for there is respiration through the windpipe which leads from the chest as well as respiration through the nostrils and without a windpipe the nostrils themselves could not respire at all animals may even be deprived of respiration through the nostrils and suffer no harm but if the use of the windpipe is shut off they die in certain animals indeed respiration through the nostrils is employed by nature for the secondary function of smell although almost all animals are endowed with the sense of smell they do not all employ the same organ for this purpose on this subject however we have spoken elsewhere more in detail empedocles asserts that inspiration and expiration take place through particular veins in which there is blood although they are not entirely filled with blood and that these veins are provided with channels that lead into the outer air channels which are too minute for the admission of crass matter but large enough for air now the blood is so constituted as to move up and down and after its downward motion the air streams in and inspiration takes place on its upward motion expiration into the outer air ensues a process which resembles what we observe in the clepsydra thus all things breathe and breathe out air again long bloodless tubes the body's surface reach and at their close-packed vents are nostrils fixed pierced through and so a passageway is cut for air while yet the blood is hidden held when yielding blood along these channels ebbs then bursts the surging air with tempests wave within but when the blood rebounds the air is then expired again as one may see a child with smooth bronze water clock at play upon her comely hand she sets the tube and dips it in the yielding water's sheen of which no drop slips in the vessel's form upon the close-packed vents the air doth press within until the maid her hand removes and frees the urgent stream which entrance makes whose even flow drives back the yielding air so too when ere the water full free flow hath filled the deep bronze tube and maiden hand the passage firm hath blocked then doth the air the eager outer air the vents make fast and hold in its restraint the inner stream whose waters at the narrow gates complain until the maiden lifts her hand and now is true the converse of what was before the air flows in the water's equal stream flows out thus also tis with fluent blood that coursing through our limbs now hurries back to inner depths 
and straightway air pours in with surging swell again the blood returns from its retreat then forthwith yields the air exhaled once more in nature's even course these are his words on the subject of respiration as we have already said animals that visibly respire do so by means of the windpipe as well as by means of the mouth and nostrils now if empedocles is speaking of respiration in this sense we must inquire how far his explanation harmonizes with the facts apparently the facts contradict his theory for in inspiration the receptacle is expanded like a brazier's bellows expansion however is naturally explained by heat and by blood which takes the place of heat but it is not explained by air in the theory of empedocles in expiration on the other hand contraction and collapse take place as in the bellows excepting that the cases are not quite parallel in this respect viz the bellows do not admit and discharge air by the same orifice whereas in inspiration and expiration the same orifice is used if however he is here referring merely to respiration through the nostrils he is quite wrong for respiration is not a function which is peculiar to the nostrils on the contrary along the passage near the uvula at the extreme end of the roof of the mouth part of the air passes here through the openings of the nostrils and part of it through the mouth and this applies equally to inspiration and expiration chapter eight it was said above that life and the possession of soul are accompanied by a certain degree of heat for even the process of concoction by which food is prepared for animal life cannot be accomplished without soul and heat all this is effected by fire consequently such a fundamental process as this must be situated in the primary region of the body and in the primary organ of this region and here it is that we must look for this elementary nutritive soul this is the middle region between the orifice for admitting food and that for discharging excrement in bloodless animals the primary organ has no name in sanguineous animals it is the heart the food out of which animal members are generated is the blood the blood and blood vessels must have the same starting point for the one as vessel and receptacle exists for the other the originating point for these vessels in sanguineous animals is the heart they do not traverse the heart they all issue from it and are attached to it as is evident from dissection now the other functions of the soul cannot be performed independently of the nutritive principle the reason for which has been stated in the treatise on the soul and the nutritive principle in turn cannot subsist without natural heat for it is through natural heat that nature has endowed the nutritive principle with warmth fire may be destroyed as we said before in two ways by extinction and by exhaustion extinction is effected by opposing forces consequently even when the fire is massed it may be extinguished by environing cold and when scattered it is more easily quenched this extinction by external force applies to animal heat as well as to inanimate fire for animals die when dismembered by instruments or when congealed by excessive cold exhaustion on the other hand follows from excessive heat for if the surrounding heat is great and the internal supply of fuel is not maintained the fire ceases to burn not from extinction by cold but from exhaustion consequently there must be some cooling process if survival is to be attained for this comes to the rescue and prevents extinction chapter nine some animals are aquatic and others have their existence on the dry land in the case of the very small and bloodless specimens of both classes the cooling produced by their surroundings whether air or water is adequate to protect them against the above-mentioned extinction 
for being endowed with little heat they need little protection animals of this kind are consequently in the rule short-lived for a slight change on one side or the other destroys the balance the longer-lived insects which like all insects are bloodless have a fissure just below the middle part in order that cooling may be effected through the membrane which at this point is very thin for inasmuch as they have more heat they have more need of cooling bees for example some of which live as long as seven years and the other insects that hum such as wasps cockchafers and locusts belong to this class they produce this noise by their breath as if by panting as the natural breathing within rises and falls it produces friction against the membrane in the middle region for insects keep this region in motion just as animals that breathe the outer air maintain motion by their lungs or fishes by their gills this motion is similar to what would take place if one should suffocate a respiring animal by holding its mouth for then this swelling movement would be produced by the lungs in the latter case however such motion is inadequate for cooling although it is adequate in the case of insects by means of friction against a membrane they produce a humming noise as we said in much the same way as children make a noise through a perforated reed after stretching a thin membrane in it and it is in this way too that the singing locusts produce their song they possess greater heat than other varieties and have a fissure in the middle region in the songless locusts this fissure is lacking sanguineous animals endowed with lungs that contain little blood and are spongy can live a long time without respiration because the lungs are capable of great expansion containing as they do little blood or fluid consequently their own peculiar motion is adequate for cooling through a considerable period finally however it is unable to continue this and without respiration it suffocates as we said before that form of exhaustion which consists in destruction through lack of cooling is called suffocation and animals that die in this way are said to be suffocated we have already remarked that insects do not respire one can observe this plainly in the case of small insects such as flies and bees for they can swim a long time in a liquid provided it is not too hot or too cold and yet animals which have less strength require more frequent respiration they are destroyed however and are suffocated as we say when the belly is filled with water and the heat of the middle region quenched from this we can understand how it is that such insects get up again after being covered for some time with warm ashes we also observe that bloodless aquatic animals live in the air longer than do sanguineous animals that take in sea-water as the fishes for the former have little heat and consequently the air is adequate to cool them for a considerable time as is the case with crustaceas and polyps and yet it is finally inadequate for life because they possess little heat for even fishes are often dug out of the earth and found to be living although motionless animals that are endowed either with no lungs at all or with lungs containing little blood need the least frequent respiration end of chapter nine recording in memory of mitchell edwards ten of on respiration in parva naturalia by aristotle translated by william alexander hammond this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by geoffrey edwards chapter ten in regard to bloodless animals we have said that some of them owe their survival to the surrounding air others to the water in the case of animals that have blood and a heart all those that are provided with lungs take in air and effect cooling by means of inspiration and expiration now viviparous animals are provided with lungs not those however that bear their living young outside of themselves 
for the cartilaginous fishes are viviparous but not within their own bodies and amongst oviparous animals those that have wings are provided with lungs as e g birds and further such animals as have scales like the tortoises lizards and snakes viviparous animals have a lung well filled with blood whereas most of the oviparous animals have spongy lungs therefore as we said before the latter need less frequent respiration all of them however do breathe even those that live and maintain their existence in the water such as hydras frogs crocodiles fresh-water tortoises tortoises of the sea and land and seals for all of these animals and others similar to them bear their young on the land and sleep either on land or in the water with their mouths above the surface for respiration animals on the other hand that have gills are cooled by taking in water to this class belong the cartilaginous fishes and other apodous animals including all fishes for their organs of locomotion are after the analogy of wings rather than feet amongst animals that have feet only one so far as has been observed has gills viz the tadpole as we call it but no case has ever been seen of the possession of lungs and gills together the reason is that the lungs are designed for cooling by the admission of air even the name pneumon quotes lungs seems to have been derived from the reception of pneuma quotes air and gills are designed for cooling by the admission of water but only one organ is used for one purpose and one method of cooling is adequate for each animal and so since we know that nature makes nothing in vain and since one of these two organs would be useless some animals are provided with gills and others with lungs but no animal with both chapter eleven since every animal needs food for its subsistence and cooling for its persistence nature employs for these two purposes one organ and as in some animals the tongue is employed for the double purpose of tasting and communicating thought so in those which are provided with lungs the mouth serves for the mastication of food as well as for inspiration and expiration of air in those on the other hand that have no lungs and do not respire the mouth serves for the mastication of food but gills are provided for cooling where cooling is needed in what way the functioning of the aforesaid organs effects cooling we shall explain later in order not to hinder the admission of food a similar method is employed by respiring animals and by those that take in water for in the former case they avoid respiring and swallowing their food at the same instant otherwise they would choke by admitting liquid or solid food into the lungs through the windpipe for the windpipe lies in front of the oesophagus through which food finds its way into the stomach in the sanguineous quadrupeds the windpipe is provided with a sort of lid called the epiglottis in birds and oviparous quadrupeds on the contrary there is no such lid but they attain the same end by contracting the windpipe when food is being swallowed the ovipara contract the windpipe whereas the vivipara close the epiglottis and after the food has passed in the one case the windpipe is expanded and in the other the epiglottis is opened and air is admitted for the purpose of cooling in regard to those animals that are provided with gills they discharge the water through these and then admit food through the mouth they have no windpipe so that they can suffer no harm by the wrong discharge of water into it but only by the entrance of water into the stomach for this reason the discharge of water and the swallowing of food is done rapidly and their teeth are sharp and in almost all instances are serrated for they cannot chew their food chapter twelve regarding the cetaceous aquatic animals such as dolphins whales and such others as have what is known as a spout organ one might feel some doubt 
yet even these conform to our theory for they are apodous and although they have lungs they take in sea-water the ground for this apparent exception is given in the foregoing explanation for the end to which they take in water is not cooling this is produced in their case by means of respiration for they have lungs consequently they sleep with their mouths above the water surface and dolphins it is certain snore again when they are caught in nets they soon suffocate from lack of respiration it is in order to breathe then that we observe them lying on the sea surface since however they are forced to take their food in the water they must on swallowing discharge the water and for this reason they are all provided with a spout organ when they have taken in water they discharge it through this spout organ just as fishes do through their gills a proof of this fact is the position of the spout organ it does not lead to any of the blood-filled organs but is situated in front of the brain and discharges the water here for the same reason the mollusks and crustaceans admit and discharge water i mean the sea crayfish and crabs as we call them they make no use of it for cooling for they are endowed with only a small amount of heat and are in every case bloodless so that they are kept cool enough by the surrounding water but it is discharged on account of their food viz in order that the water may not enter at the moment of swallowing the crustaceans such as the sea crayfish and crabs discharge the water through the plated folds along their shaggy covering the purple fish and polyps discharge it through the hollow passage above the head these questions have been treated with greater detail in the history of animals concerning the phenomenon of the admission and discharge of water we have said that it is due in certain cases to the need of cooling and in others to the fact that aquatic animals are obliged to swallow their food in the water chapter thirteen we must next describe the method by which cooling is effected in respiring animals and in those provided with gills we have already said that animals which have lungs respire as to the reason why some animals have this organ and why those that have it need respiration it is because the higher order of animals are endowed with greater heat at the same time it must be that they are endowed with a higher order of soul for such beings are of a higher order than plants consequently animals whose lungs are more abundantly supplied with blood and heat are of greater bodily dimensions than others and the animal that is supplied with the purest and most abundant blood i e man is the most erect of all animals and his upper structure points to the upper region of the universe true of him alone because he has lungs constituted as we have described the essential character both of man and of other animals must therefore be ascribed as much to this as to any other organ this then is the purpose of the lungs one must suppose that the material conditions and moving cause have constructed these animals in this way as they have also operated to produce other animals with a different constitution for some are composed chiefly of earth like plants others chiefly of water like aquatic animals and amongst the winged and terrestrial animals the one class is composed chiefly of air and the other of fire and they severally have their place in regions akin to their own natures chapter fourteen empedocles was wrong in saying that the aquatic animals are warmest and contain most fire and being defective in cold and fluid they seek refuge from constitutional excess of heat in a medium to which their nature is opposed for water is cooler than air it is however altogether unintelligible how animals born on dry land can change their place of abode to water for they are in almost all cases apodous and yet when speaking of their primary constitution he asserts they are born on the dry land and later leave this and migrate to the water again our observation shows that they are not warmer than land animals 
for some of them are absolutely bloodless while others are almost so but what kind of animals we should call warm and what kind cold is a subject itself that requires investigation regarding the explanation given by empedocles his contention is in a certain sense correct although what he says is not entirely true for it is true that regions and seasons which exhibit characteristics opposed to abnormal conditions in animals tend to preserve them and yet their normal nature is best preserved in a place of abode similar to their own constitution for the matter out of which animals are severally constituted must not be confounded with the varying states and conditions of this matter i mean e g if a thing were formed of wax or ice its preservation would not be secured by placing it in a hot environment for owing to the opposed nature of its surroundings it would be quickly destroyed for heat melts that which consists of the contrary nature again if a thing were composed of salt or nitre nature would not carry it and set it down in a wet environment for water dissolves substances of a warm dry constitution if therefore the fluid and solid constitute the matter out of which all bodies are formed it is reasonable to suppose that fluid and cold structures will be found in a moist environment solid structures on the other hand in a solid environment consequently trees do not grow in water but in the earth although according to the same theory of empedocles they should migrate to the water because of their being predominantly dry or to use his expression quote, predominantly fiery close quote. this migration would be to water not because it is cold but because it is fluid the natural constitution of matter therefore conforms to the environment in which it is found the moist e g is found in water the warm in the air acquired conditions however are better regulated through an opposite environment excessive heat through cold surroundings and excessive cold through warm surroundings for the environment reduces the excess in these conditions and brings them to an equable mean this reduction is to be sought in an environment adapted to the particular constitution of the thing and in the variations of ordinary climate for acquired conditions may be opposed to the place of abode but this is impossible in the case of the original constitution touching the theory of empedocles that animals are divided into aquatic and land animals on the basis of differences in natural heat and touching the explanation of the phenomenon that the one class has lungs and the other not let the foregoing discussion suffice end of chapter fourteen recording in memory of mitchell edwards chapter fifteen of on respiration in parva naturalia by aristotle translated by william alexander hammond this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by geoffrey edwards chapter fifteen the reason why animals with lungs can take in air and respire especially such as have lungs well filled with blood is to be found in the fact that the lungs are porous and filled with tubes the lungs contain more blood than any other organ in what we call the viscera animals whose lungs are abundantly supplied with blood need rapid refrigeration because of the delicate balancing of the natural heat and because the cooling process must penetrate through the entire interior owing to the great supply of blood and heat air can easily meet both these demands for owing to its rarity it rapidly penetrates everywhere and effects cooling this is not true of water it is also plain from this why it is that animals which have lungs well filled with blood breathe best it is due to the fact that the warmer the nature the greater is the need of cooling and at the same time that the air fills the lungs it passes readily to the original source of animal heat in the heart chapter sixteen 
the way in which a passage is made between heart and lungs must be studied through dissection and in the history of animals animal nature in general needs cooling because of the vital fire in the heart this is accomplished by means of respiration excepting in those cases where animals are provided with a heart only but no lungs when they have a heart but no lungs as is the case in fishes whose natural abode is water cooling is attained by water through the use of the gills in regard to the relative positions of heart and gills one must study them ocularly in dissection and their nicer philosophy in the history of animals to give a summary description however the case is as follows one might suppose that the position of the heart in land and aquatic animals was different as a matter of fact it is the same in both for the direction in which the animal's head naturally inclines is the direction in which the heart's apex is turned but inasmuch as the heads of land animals do not incline in the same direction as those of aquatic animals the heart's apex in the latter case is turned towards the mouth a sinewy vein-like tube extends from the extremity of the heart to a central point where all the gills are united this is the largest of all the tubes but there are others on each side of the heart which extend to the several extremities of the gills whereby cooling is produced and transmitted to the heart the water being constantly piped through the gills the rapid swelling and falling motion of the thorax in inhaling and exhaling air serves the same purpose in respiring animals that the movement of gills does in fishes respiring animals suffocate in a small quantity of air that remains unchanged for each medium water as well as air soon becomes hot and contact with the blood heats them when however the blood becomes hot the process of cooling is impeded also when respiring animals become unable to inflate their lungs or aquatic animals to move their gills whether owing to disease or to the weakness of old age their end must be at hand chapter seventeen birth and death are phenomena common to all animals although there are specific differences in their modes of occurrence death is not everywhere the same although in its varied forms there is a common element death ensues from violence or from the ordinary course of nature death is violent when due to an external cause natural when due to internal processes the latter conforms to the original organic structure and is not an adventitious condition in plants this process is called decay in animals senility death and decay attach to all organisms alike that are complete and to the incomplete also but in a different way under incomplete i understand such things as eggs and seeds of plants which as yet have not taken root death is caused in all things by lack of heat in complete organisms by its failure in that part where the vital principle is lodged this principle is lodged as we said above in the middle region where the upper and lower parts are conjoined in plants it is the point at which stem and root unite in sanguineous animals it is the heart in bloodless animals in an organ analogous to the heart in some of the bloodless animals we find many vital centres potentially though not actually for this reason certain insects when divided continue to live and such sanguineous animals as are not highly organised live a considerable time after the removal of the heart as is true of tortoises tortoises continue to move their feet so long as their shell is not removed because their organisation is of a lower order resembling in this respect the insects the vital principle succumbs in its possessor when the heat which is its accompaniment is not reduced by cooling for otherwise as we have often remarked it is consumed by its own agency when therefore the lungs or gills respectively become hardened or dried up and earthy through lapse of time it is impossible for these organs to function to dilate and contract and finally when a further demand is made upon them the fire of life is extinguished consequently death quickly ensues in old age 
even on the appearance of trivial ailments this is due to the fact that there is little heat left in old age most of it having been exhaled in a long life and if any extra strain is put upon the lungs life is speedily quenched for the fire within being now but a tiny feeble flame is extinguished by a slight movement that is also the reason why death in old age is painless for death comes to the aged with no element of violence in it rather the dissolution of the soul occurs quite without their feeling it diseases which make the lungs hard whether by tubercles or deposits or by excessive morbid heat as in fevers produce an acceleration of the breathing because the lungs are incapable of full expansion and contraction and finally when motion is no longer possible men exhale their breath and die chapter eighteen birth then is the original suffusion of the nutritive soul with heat and life is the maintenance of this heat youth is commensurate with the growth of the primary organ of cooling old age with the wasting of the organ and the prime of life with the middle period between the two death and violent destruction mean respectively the exhaustion and extinction of the vital heat for it is destroyed from both causes exhaustion is given in the nature of the thing itself and is caused by lapse of time and by the completion of a normal term of life in plants this is called decay in animals death death in old age is due to the exhaustion of the organism that comes from senile inability to effect cooling we have now explained the meaning of birth life and death and have treated the causes of these phenomena in animals chapter nineteen from these considerations one may clearly see why it is that respiring animals are suffocated in water while fishes are suffocated in the air for in one case cooling is effected by the medium of water in the other by that of air and both of them are deprived of this by the change in their place of abode we have further to explain the movement in gills and lungs respectively exhalation and inhalation in the one case and the admission and discharge of water in the other we have also to explain the structure of the organ of respiration in what follows chapter twenty there are three phenomena regarding the heart which might be supposed to have the same nature but are different viz palpitation pulsation and respiration now palpitation is a compression of heat in the heart owing to cooling in other parts of the body produced by excretion or waste such as we see in the disease called palpitation of the heart as well as in other diseases and in fear also in fear the upper regions of the body are cold and their heat is discharged and collected in the heart where palpitation is caused and the heat being thus compressed into a small space it sometimes happens that animals are suffocated and die from fear and its morbid conditions the phenomenon of pulsation however that occurs in the heart and which as we see is a constant process is similar to the throbbing in an abscess in the latter the movement is painful owing to abnormal change in the blood this process continues to a point where the blood is concocted and converted into pus the condition is analogous to boiling for boiling takes place when water is evaporated by heat and it bubbles up owing to its increase in volume the development of abscesses is arrested when the pus is not evaporated and the liquid becomes very thick the process in boiling is arrested when the confining vessel is overflowed the supply of moisture derived from food and its expansion through heat produces pulsation in the heart the expansion extending to the heart's outer covering and this is a constant process for the flow of fluid to the heart out of which the blood is generated is constant it is in the heart that blood is first formed one can observe this plainly in the growth of an embryo for before the veins are distinguishable the heart is seen to contain blood pulsation for this reason is more marked in youth 
than in old age for the process of evaporation is stronger in youth the blood vessels all pulsate and they do so simultaneously for they are all connected with the heart and originate in it the heart however is in constant motion so too the blood vessels are in constant motion and simultaneously with each other as long as the heart moves palpitation then is a reaction in the heart due to the compression of heat by the cooling of other parts of the body pulsation is the evaporation of the moist element as it becomes heated chapter twenty one respiration is due to the increase of the heated element in which the nutritive principle is lodged as all other bodily elements need maintenance so does this element of vital heat and even in a greater degree than the others for it is the source of maintenance for the other elements when it is increased it necessarily expands the organ in which it is found one must conceive the structure of this organ to resemble a brazier's bellows for neither lungs nor heart differ very much from a form such as is illustrated by a bellows both are double the nutritive principle must be situated in the centre of the vital power the lungs then increase and expand and by expanding the part in which they are lodged must also expand we see this when we respire for the thorax is then expanded because the inherent principle in this part is expanded owing to this expansion as one sees in the bellows cold air must be introduced from without and by its cooling effect the excess of internal heat is lowered but just as the organ was expanded owing to the increase of heat so now it necessarily contracts when the heat is diminished and by contracting the air which was inhaled is again discharged air that was cold when admitted but warm when discharged owing to contact with the heat inherent in the organ especially in the case of animals whose lungs are well filled with blood the air enters through a mass of pipes canals as it were with which the lungs are provided and blood vessels extend alongside each of these pipes so that the entire lung appears to be filled with blood the admission of air is termed inspiration and its discharge expiration the process of respiration is continuous so long as life and this organic motion continue life therefore is given in the processes of inspiration and expiration the movement of the gills in fishes is produced in the same way for by the expansion of the blood's heat in its course through the members the gills are lifted and water passes through when on the other hand the heat retreats to the heart through the channels and cooling is effected the gills are lowered and the water passes out the expansion of the heart's heat is constant and its readmission when cooled is constant and so in animals provided with lungs life and death are ultimately conditioned by respiration and in fishes by the admission of water this then is a statement of our views of life and death and of almost all the questions germane to them it is the province not only of the physician but also of the natural philosopher up to a certain point to discuss questions of health and disease we must not however forget how these two classes of men differ and how they regard a subject from different points of view although experience shows that both professions are to a certain extent at least conterminous for the better educated and more painstaking physicians are conversant with the laws of nature and deem it correct to derive their principles of practice from this source while the best trained philosophers of nature almost always conclude with a discussion of the principles of medicine end of chapter twenty one end of on respiration and end of parva naturalia by aristotle Translated by William Alexander Hammond. Meta coordinated by Joe. Proof listened by Guedo. Read by Geoffrey Edwards. Recording in memory of Mitchell Edwards.